I'd invite you to open up to our scripture passage today. We're continuing on in our series through the book of Luke, and so today we're looking at Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Uh, Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke 19, starting in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Our father, we ask that you would speak to us today. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this short story and yet it is so memorable and, and so there's something about it we love And Lord, we pray that you would, by the power of your Spirit, speak to us the truth that is in it, so that we would behold your glory and see more clearly how you have drawn us to yourself. And more than anything, we pray that you would use your words to transform us and make us more like Christ. We pray this all in his name. Amen. Well, for those of you that have kids, you know that when fishing with young kids, it's hard to actually call it fishing (laughs) because the most important skills aren't so much fishing related, but are actually keen eyesight and fine motor skills to be able to untangle the never ending knots of fishing line. And as soon as you get one untangled, somebody else gets their line tangled. But one of the joys now that my kids are a little bit older is that we actually get to fish. And one of the joys for me is I actually get to fish when I take my kids fishing. And so, uh, starting last summer, we, we were started going to the lake at daybreak, because it's just a few minutes from our house, and it turns out there's a never-ending supply of bluegill and sunfish that are always eager to eat our worms. But there's also a good number of bass in that lake, and some of them are big. And this summer, I've been trying to catch the mega bass. So a month or so ago, we were uh, fishing in one of our usual spots, and all of a sudden, I got a bite. And as I started reeling it in, I knew it was something way bigger than the pole from that normal kind of five inch bluegill that we catch. And then it splashed up in the water and I only saw it for a split second, but it was enough for me to realize that it was a big bass, maybe the biggest one that I've caught in that lake. And I was so excited. So I was reeling it in and 12 feet out, 10 feet, eight feet, six feet, and then snap, my line broke and it got away. But I was hooked, and I wanted to catch that bass. And so Luke and I, that night, we decided to call it the mega bass. And we kept going back to that spot. And while he was just racking up the bluegill, I kept casting to that area where I thought the mega bass lived. And I would get some bites every once in a while, but no hooks. And then a few weeks later, bam, I got it again, another strong bite. And this time, I was very careful. Pull it in, not too tar. Don't let it jerk too much. But I was being too careful because then, all of a sudden when I started pulling, I didn't get any movement on the line. And I let the the rod down and the line went slack. And I realized I had caught the line on a rock underwater or something like that. But there was a dock to the side and so I walked over and from a different angle was trying to release the line and I was able to free it and all of a sudden I started feeling pulling again. And I started pulling it in, I still have the fish. And then it got away. Mega bass two, me zero. And we're still going back to that spot, and I want to catch that bass before winter. Well, I I share this story because I think we see something similar in our passage today 
about how Jesus targets people. Right? Jesus is a, a better fisherman than I am. He always catches those people he's looking for. We have this well-known story of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus heard Jesus is coming to town and he wanted to meet him. But what Zacchaeus doesn't realize is that Jesus was actually looking for him all along. Jesus is in the business of seeking out sinners and irresistibly drawing them to himself. And so what I want us to remember this morning is simply this. Jesus seeks out sinners like you and me. Jesus seeks out sinners like you and me. And we're just going to walk through the story because it's such a great story. And I'll make some few, a few comments as we go through it. So we've been traveling on this journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. And now he's getting close. He's actually approaching that final week before his death. And Jericho is the last main city that he's going to pass through before he gets to Jerusalem. And it seems that word has spread. Jesus is traveling through town. And so people from the town and the surrounding villages all come out to catch a glimpse of Jesus because he's famous. And Jericho is a well-known city, probably most so because of how it was destroyed in the Old Testament. Maybe you remember that story. It's another famous kid story about how Joshua was leading the Israelites into their new home. They crossed the Jordan River and the first city they come to is Jericho. And it's a, a massive city with strong walls and the Israelites say, how are we going to defeat this city? And God gives them really interesting instructions. He tells them to basically march around the city seven times. And if you remember the kid's song, the walls came tumbling down. And that city of Jericho was destroyed. But then later on, they rebuilt a new Jericho nearby. And this new Jericho was built kind of modeled after the cities uh, of the Greek or Roman cities, which had parks in them and trees in them, unlike kind of the dense stone cities that you see in the rest of Israel. And Jericho was also something of a port city where custom taxes would be charged because it sat on a major road so that as people came from the east across the Jordan River, Jericho was kind of the entrance city into the rest of the region and the land of Israel. And so lots of taxes were charged in this city. And we meet a man, or we learn of a man whose name is Zacchaeus, who is the chief tax collector in the city. So to be the chief tax collector in Jericho was a top job because it was a, a city that brought in a lot of taxes. And tax collectors typically came from the local population, but they were in service of the Roman government. And they collected taxes from their region to support the empire. And the way they made a living is Rome charged a certain amount, and then they would essentially tack on top of that a surcharge or a convenience fee or a processing fee that they then took so that they could make a living and then pass the rest of the taxes on to the Roman government. And almost everybody had their fingers in that pot of taxes. So you had the tax collectors on the ground. They took some of it. And then the middle managers, they took some of it. And then Zacchaeus took some of it as well. And so if you were just an average citizen paying taxes... Well, you saw your taxes increasingly went up and up as more people tried to get some of that money, and yet they still needed to pass on the right amount of money to Rome. And so you can imagine tax collectors were not very popular. They were seen often because they came from the local populace as people that had turned their backs on their own people in service of a corrupt and oppressive Roman government, and then many of them got rich off of it. And so here is Zacchaeus, not a popular guy in town, and he hears that Jesus is passing through town. Verse 3 tells us he wanted to see who Jesus was. He'd heard something of Jesus. There had been rumors. He had heard something that had intrigued him, and he wanted to see for himself who is this man named Jesus. I think one of the things that's so neat about this story is there's all these little details here that really illustrate what it often looks like for someone to come to faith. And for many of you here, you have come to faith in the last handful of years, and there is something often that initially set you on that journey to know Christ, right? to explore Christianity. It's a number of different things, but something happens, and now you start getting interested. Maybe you start looking at churches online, or you start reading your Bible, or you're listening to sermons, and that's, I think, the same thing that is happening to Zacchaeus here. Something has intrigued him, and he wants to learn more about Jesus. 
But Zacchaeus has a problem. There's lots of people that want to see Jesus, and he's short. Right? This is maybe the first recorded instance of someone with short man syndrome, right? That idea of people, guys that are extra short, compensate for it by being extra domineering or aggressive or ruthless, right? And despite his height, Zacchaeus has risen to be the top, top tax collector, a profession known for cheats, in one of the most desirable cities. He had to have been fairly ruthless to get that job. And he runs ahead and he climbs a tree so he can maybe get a glimpse of Jesus. And many have noted that he so desires to see Jesus, he doesn't care if people think he's silly or kind of a fool for climbing a tree. I, I think that's true, but I think it shows us something about his character that he really is driven and determined that he won't find a problem that he can't find a solution to. And that's certainly one of the ways in which he's risen to that position. And so he's going to see Jesus one way or the other. And Jesus is making his way down the street. And as I said, this city was different than many of the other cities in the area, that it had parks and trees in it. And so it's easy to imagine that probably lots of different kids and young adults had climbed trees as well in order to gl get a glimpse of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, though, Jesus is walking down and he looks up and he doesn't see a kid in a tree, but a grown man who just is short looking down at him. And I think this is one of the most remarkable parts of the story because Zacchaeus climbed that tree because he wanted to see Jesus, but little did he know that something much bigger was happening, that Zacchaeus had actually climbed that tree so that Jesus could see him and call him by name and completely upend his life. Jesus isn't surprised to see a short man in a tree. It's like he was waiting for that all along. And he even knows his name, right? Just something about the story, it makes it sound like Jesus has been waiting to burst out with saying Zacchaeus' name, Zacchaeus, I've been waiting for you. It's like he'd been waiting to come over to his house. Zacchaeus had just been learning about Jesus, but it seems like Jesus knew about him all along. It was like the universe was conspiring to put Zacchaeus in just the right spot so that Jesus could upend his life. And there are many of you here who have experienced something like that in your story of coming to faith, where something happens, you start looking for Jesus, you start exploring, and then all of a sudden things come together and you feel like maybe Jesus had known you all along. And he was just waiting for the right time to let you know that. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. At just the right time, Jesus breaks into his life. Zacchaeus comes down. He welcomes him in, into his home. But some people see this and they start to grumble. Verse 7. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner, the people say about Jesus. I think there's kind of two things that are going on here. This is a, a criticism that is often leveled at Jesus. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. Throughout the book of Luke, maybe you've noticed, there are six references to tax collectors in this book. And yet what is remarkable is they're actually all favorable. <laughs> in your conversations, how many times, what's your ratio of favorable to unfavorable things about tax collectors? It seems like Jesus really liked IRS agents. And this reaction to Jesus going to Zacchaeus' house reveals something about those people's hearts, but also our hearts, I think. That I'm sure all of us would say that we like the idea of grace. Oh, I need grace. I want grace. But when we see grace go to people that we think are undeserving, we get upset about it. Well, not grace for them. I just want grace for me, which I think shows we don't really believe in grace. We believe that grace is kind of like some reward for my effort, right? I'm putting in this effort, God will reward me, and it'll be more than what I deserve, so that's grace. But if we really believed in grace, we would rejoice when we see those taxmen receiving the forgiveness of Jesus. But then there's another thing that's happening here. I think people see a conversion like this, and they see it with some skepticism. 
because there have been many cheats and criminals that come to Christ. But it can feel like they come to Christ just as a way to not get punished and not so much that Jesus has actually changed their life. And so it's easy to imagine some of the crowd's, the crowd's skepticism here. Oh, here's Zacchaeus who's found religion now after he cheated us after all this money and he's rich and now this is just a way that he's maybe using to get us to like him after taking all of our money and saying that we need to forgive him. But verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Here and now. Note his eagerness. I get the sense he's an eager guy in whatever he does, whether climbing trees or writing checks. And he shows the genuineness of his faith through his actions. He, he stands in contrast to the rich young ruler that Pastor West preached about a few weeks ago who walked away from Jesus because he wasn't willing to give everything away to the poor. Now here, though, Zacchaeus doesn't give everything away. But imagine if he's giving away 50% of his net worth to the poor and then paying back four times the amount of anything he's cheated, that's going to be a significant ding to his net worth. And, and some commentators note even there's ambiguity in his statement about if I've cheated anyone, where some would translate it from whomever I have wrongfully exacted anything. Meaning that he knows that he has cheated some people, he just can't remember how many people he's cheated. Now in the Old Testament, if you were to steal something or unlawfully take something in general, you were required to pay back what you took and then add a fifth on top of that. But Zacchaeus is going to give four times that, so to make that more concrete... And if Zacchaeus has cheated someone out of $100, the Old Testament rule would have been that he should give back $120. But Zacchaeus is offering to give back $400. You get a sense of how much he's willing to pay to make things right. He's not just become a Christian because he wants to get out of the consequences of his actions. No, it's actually the very opposite. His following Jesus has led him to voluntarily embrace the consequences for how he's wronged people. He wants to make things right. He wants to go beyond that. He realizes that he has received a free grace, but it's not a cheap grace. His actions show us something, a couple key things about repentance and true repentance. I think the first thing is that true repentance will always be marked by some type of outward actions. Now, this is a, a tricky needle to thread because it's easy to make one of two errors here. First, because we say we are saved by grace completely, you can sometimes think, well, then I don't need to do anything that is tied to my repentance because I'm saved by grace, so why do I need to do anything to change? But true repentance will always lead to some sort of action. Otherwise, it's hard to say it's true repentance. Because if repentance is about your heart and what you've done, and if your heart is pierced by what you've done, you're going to want to change things to make them right or to not make the same mistake. Now, your actions don't lead, don't result in that forgiveness, but they flow out of it. So if you're struggling with sin in your life, whether it's anger or sexual sin or pornography or greed or drunkenness or lying or whatever sin it is that you continually, habitually struggle with and, and you feel bad after doing it, you pray for forgiveness and then you move on, but you don't really make any changes in your life. And then that cycle continues for months and even years. You have to ask yourself, is this repentance genuine? Because if it's not leading me to want to make changes, has my heart really been affected by what I've done? We need to see that action is a fruit of true repentance. But the other error in here is to think that you need to do something in order to gain forgiveness. And this is a subtle but important difference. Forgiveness is free. You don't need to do anything to earn forgiveness. 
But the reason it's free to you is because it was costly to Jesus, demanding his very life. And if you realize the cost that Jesus has paid so that you can be freely forgiven, that must motivate you to want to change. But don't think you can do anything to earn that forgiveness. But how many of us, you go through life thinking you need to earn forgiveness, thinking that you can work off your guilt somehow. But that will never work. No, you can rest in the grace of God. You are fully, freely forgiven through Christ when you come to Him. And it is free because it was costly to Jesus. So the next thing I want us to see about true repentance is that it will look different for each person. For Zacchaeus, it it meant giving away the majority of his wealth. For the rich young ruler earlier in the book, it looked like giving away everything that he had. For you, it might be one thing. For someone else, it's another thing. Now, Now, why can it be different for each person? Well, again, it goes back to what the reason is for changing your actions. And because your actions aren't about paying for your forgiveness, remember that forgiveness is free, Jesus has paid it all, it means that it's not like you're trying to pay off a bill that you owe. It's not like you have to keep doing things until you satisfy God for how you've messed up. Now, if you've wronged people, part of the fruit of repentance is trying to make those things right as much as you are able. Pay back the people you've cheated, restore a relationship, seek forgiveness. But it's not like God sends you a monthly account statement showing you how much you've paid down your debt through your good actions for how you've messed up. No, your actions are, as Scripture says, the fruit of repentance. And I think fruit's a good word because fruit is, comes at the end of a whole process, right? It's kind of the crowning jewel of an entire process that has taken place. The actions, the fruit, are indicative of a changed heart that has been broken. And that's why repentance can look different for each person. The heart is the goal. The goal is that your heart is changed, not that you've paid off the bill. You, we, we can never pay off the bill. And that's why it looks different for each person, because someone's heart might lead them to do this to make it right. Someone's heart might lead them to do this to make things right. In Jesus... God alone can see the heart. And that's why he's uniquely able to say what he says next. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. And to be a son of Abraham wasn't just something that you were born into, but it it meant that you actually were living in Abraham's faith. It meant that you have been brought into God's true family. It means that Zacchaeus had been adopted into God's family, that he had become a Christian. And this is not something that's automatic, but must happen through faith in Christ. Presumably, Zacchaeus went back to being a tax collector. I'm guessing this because earlier in Luke chapter 3, verse 13, it says, even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, they're asking John the Baptist here, what should we do? And he answers, Don't collect any more taxes than you are required to. So now Zacchaeus, though, is a Christian tax collector. He no longer cheated people. He was generous with his money. I think this shows the importance of having Christians who are living out their values in secular workspaces, particularly in those spaces that are known for corruption, and even having the courage to live as a Christian with Christian morals and values in those spaces, even if it means you make less money than other people, which I think Zacchaeus is about to learn all about. And and then Jesus says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And here we have the point of the whole story. What does it look like for Jesus to seek and save the lost? And this story is actually something of a meta story of of telling us this key purpose of why Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. I'm seeking out the mega bass. I know kind of where he tends to hang out, at least right now. 
I've double checked my knots. I've rehearsed in my mind how I'm going to reel them in. And if I catch him, I'll figure out a way to include it in a sermon illustration. (laughs) But Jesus is the great fisherman. A good fisherman, they can know how to target a certain species, right, or type of fish, or size of fish. But look here, Jesus targets specific people. He knows the names of the people that he's seeking. Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus thought he was just going to climb that tree to get a glimpse of Jesus, but God knew and God had arranged for him to climb that tree so that he could call his name and look at his face. I love Jesus' words in John 6.37, where he says, Those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but I should raise them up on the last day. The story of Zacchaeus is a picture of that, how Jesus targets people by name. God does this work of drawing them to himself and at just the right time breaks in irresistibly to call them to himself. And do you see the comfort in that? It means Jesus can't lose you. He knows your name. He won't miss you. It's like the roles of heaven aren't just a certain number. Oh, we need, you know, billion people up here, whatever that number is, billions of people up here. And once we get that number, okay, we're good. And hopefully you're there, right? No, the roles of heaven have individual names on them. And Jesus is doing the work through his people right now of checking off every one of those names to make sure every single person that he has called is there. You can't be lost by him. And in fact, he's woven together every detail of your life so that when you climb that tree to get a glimpse of this person that you've heard about, you have no idea how much your life is about to change. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you visited or kind of sitting on the outskirts. You've worked up the courage to come to church in person. And you think maybe you're just beginning this journey to know Christ, but God has been directing your steps from the beginning, leading you to this moment, to himself. And you may think you're alone in this faith journey, but what you'll discover at some point is you're just starting to learn Jesus' name, but he's known your name from the very beginning. And he's actually been with you every step of this journey, even if you didn't realize it yet. And at just the right time, he will call you by name, And open up your eyes to his presence that's been there all along. And open your eyes to the one who has loved you from before time, even though you're just starting to wake up to that love. And so don't resist it. Don't fight it. Don't let things hold you back. Climb the tree if you need to. Look like a fool. Because Jesus and Jesus alone can love you back to life. He and he alone will nail all of your sins to his cross. He and he alone can make you bright and beautiful. And he does that for sinners like you and me. So will you invite him into your home today? Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would help us to seek you. Father, for those of you who are still, that are still just on their faith journey and and exploring you, we pray that they would hear you calling them by name to yourself, that you would open up their eyes and that they would see that they are just now waking up to a love that has been there all along. We pray for us, Father, who know you. Lord, let us not grow dull in our faith. Let us not grow dull in our repentance, but to have some of that drive and determination and zeal to live for you like we see Zacchaeus doing here because of your great forgiveness. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.